Centuries ago, a Jewish man goes to his rabbi after the Sabbath and says to his uh, rabbi, I realized I have caused problems with what I've said. I've stirred the pot, I've gossiped, I've hurt, hurt my neighbors like this, and, uh, and I've gone to my neighbors and I've tried to apologize, but it doesn't seem to be quite right. What should I do? And so the rabbi went inside the house, got a bag of feathers, and brought it out and handed the bag of feathers to this man and sa said to him, take a feather and put it on the doorstep of every person upon to which you've talked ill, and then come back the next morning. And so he does this, and he comes back the next morning, and, he's, and he tells the rabbi, I've put a feather on the doorstep of every person of whom I've talked ill, of whom I've hurt with my words. And the rabbi says, okay, now go put all the feathers back in the bag. And the guy says, but those feathers, they could have blown anywhere. And he says, so have your words. Now go do it. And he went to gather feathers. A different time, a different place, a woman goes to talk to her pastor and says to her pastor, uh, I was reading the book of James last night at Bible study and I came across that point that says tame your tongue and I realized my tongue has not been tamed and I have caused problems with my words and I've caused problems in the church, I've caused problems in the town and, and, and pastor I need to make it right and I've gone and talked to people but you know I, I say I'm sorry but it's just not, a, a, what should I do pastor? And the pastor goes inside and he gets a plate. He walks outside and shows the woman the plate. And he picks up two pieces of the plate and he says, I'm sorry. And he asks the woman, did that fix the plate? No. And he asks her, what would it take to fix this plate? A lot of super glue and a whole lot of time, right? So he handed her the super glue and she went forth to start putting plates back together. Two stories, pretty much the same point, right? Which one are you going to remember? Plate, right? The feather, that's good, that's catchy, but you didn't see that coming. And the first time I smashed a plate like that, it kind of surprised me too. Didn't expect it to be that loud. The prophet Jeremiah says this, tells the same story, does the same thing again and again and again. For over 50 chapters, he's making the same point. He's saying to the people, you've you got to turn back to God. Stop worshiping all these other gods. You've got to stop ignoring the needs of the needy. You've got to stop ignoring the widows, the orphans, the immigrants, the outcasts, these people who have no one else to speak up for them. You've got to speak up for them. And, and you know how many times can you hear that before it gets kind of old? So what the prophet did, with God's prompting, is he, he, put, he, made, he did these uh, prophetic signs, is what they're called. What I would call them is good sermon illustrations. He put together these prophetic signs, much like this, to sort of pound at home so people would remember. He did things like he would get a, a, some underwear, a linen loincloth, and he buried it by the Euphrates, this river. He let it sit there by, for a nice long time, and then went, he went back and he dug up this underwear. And it was rotten. And it stank. And it, was, it was ruined. And he put that underwear on and he walked into town. And everyone looked at him and said, what? And he said, we are meant to cling to God like underwear clings to us. And yet because we do not cling to God, we have rotten just like that. People remember that, right? And then he doesn't get married. Another prophetic sign. He doesn't get married. And in that day and age, that this... It, it didn't, that didn't fly. The first commandment in the Old Testament is be fruitful and multiply. And, and for him not to get married, be fruitful, have kids, that, that's crazy. And it, so at some point, people started asking him, dude, why aren't you married? And he would say, the, the covenant, the relationship between God and Judah is so broken that it's fallen apart and it's going to get really bad. And, and in the same way, I'm not going to enter into this covenant of marriage and have kids because it would be really bad. If you have kids right now, they are going to suffer when Babylon invades. 
And for someone to say, I'm not going to have kids because what's, what's about to happen is going to be so bad that it's, uh, it gets their attention, right? He does another prophetic sign. We read about it in Jeremiah 19. He takes a jug, he gathers together the leaders, and he gives it to them, both barrels. He tells them, you know, shape up. Put, get your nation back together. Stop offering sacrifices on every roof. And, uh, or else you will be shattered like this jug. And he sm smashes that. He then starts giving a, a, some signs of hope. He, he, uh, he goes to the, uh, the coronation of the king Zedekiah. And, and at this coronation, when all the people are gathered from all the surrounding nations, everyone sends their uh, emissaries or the king comes him, himself. He, he goes to this great gathering. Everyone has all their finery on. And he wears a, a yoke. Like a picture on the front of your bulletin, the, this wooden yoke that they would put on oxen to plow the land. And so you look around the crowd, everyone's dressed to the nines, and there's this dude wearing a, a, a yoke, and people start going, hey, what's up with him? And he, he'd tell them, Babylon's coming, and if you're going to live, put Babylon's yoke on, and you'll be okay. But if you don't, ugh. And then the last sign he gives uh, in the book of Jeremiah, when Babylon has invaded, they're coming up the mountain to Jerusalem. It, it's, it's imminent. It's about to hit. Jeremiah goes to the front gate, uh, where every, all business transactions are done, all public business transactions. And when an invading army that's obviously about to show up and whoop you sh is on the doorstep, Jeremiah shows up at the front gate and he buys land. And he makes a big deal out of it. And everyone looks at him and says, hmm? And he puts the deed in a pot and he seals it up because so, he wants everyone to know, you will buy land here again. This land is not lost forever. And so he does these prophetic signs so that people will, will remember what it is that uh, he is teaching them, what the word from the Lord is. And, and hopefully it will ring in their ears much like that still rings in mine. And so... He does all these prophetic signs, and they're the signs that we, we get from all the different types of prophets. And we have a whole bunch of prophets. Isaiah, Amos, Ezekiel, Hosea, Habakkuk, great name, Micah. We have all these prophets, have all these prophetic signs, and they're about the same message. Stop worshiping other gods. Take care of the widow, the immigrant, the orphan. Take care of the people who need it. Take care of them first. And we have all these signs the prophets do, but it is only in Jeremiah that we get the prayers that he prays in between. For what we have in the book of Jeremiah is we have, it's a scroll that Jeremiah himself dictates. The first 24 chapters, the first half of the book, are what Jeremiah told this scribe Baruch to write down. And so we get the prayers that he prays in between all of these signs of great boldness. I mean, because there's no... It's pretty bold to walk into the town square wearing rotten linen underwear. But he, here are the prayers he prays in between. He doesn't pull any punches. They're not sugar-coated. They're just honest prayers. He prays in Jeremiah 11. He finds out that someone is out to, out to get him out for his life. And you know what he prays? God, could you take them out first? Isn't that honest? I appreciate that. If someone is out for you and you want to turn to God and say, can you just take them out first? He prays in Jeremiah 12. He says, you know, God, I'm not, I know you're going to defend yourself on this, but why do the guilty prosper? The people who talk about you all the time, but you are on their lips, but far from their hearts, how come they get ahead and I'm not? Another honest prayer, right? You see people who are just horrible, and they're doing great, and you're struggling. We read in Jeremiah 15, he, he prays, you know, why was I born? You know, I'm just suffering. And, but then he's able to pray at the end of that, you know, but I know you're going to deliver me. In Jeremiah 17, he, he's just having a great day. And he, he records the prayer that he prays, O glorious throne, exalted from the beginning, shrine of our sanctuary, O hope of Israel, heal me and I will be healed. Save me and I shall be saved. Well, he's having a good day then. And then he has a bad day. He, he realizes, this is Jeremiah 18, that people are plotting against him. And he gets angry. He prays of these people, give their children over to famine, hurl them to the power of the sword, let their wives become childless. Deal with them while you are angry. 
And then sort of the longest prayer we have of his is what we read today. And he's just all over the place on this. He's just scattered. He goes from praying, God, you forced me into this. And if I don't do it, there's fire in my bones. That I just have to say what you want me to say. Then he goes and, and prays, you know, but Lord, you're going to protect me. You're going to test the righteous and we're going to sing to the Lord because you're going to deliver me. And then he ends with, but Lord, why was I born? Why did I come forth from the womb to see toil and sorrow? All right, he's, this is all jumbled together. These are the honest questions of someone who is struggling with God. And it, it leaves us questioning. When a man can go from, when a person can go from being that bold in the name of God in public and questioning that much in private, what, what do you make of that? Is he a hypocrite? Is he a hypocrite because he has this bold faith and then in private he's asking all these questions that make him a hypocrite because he is not following through for some reason? I don't think that's actually the case. What I think it shows us is that faith, a biblical faith, is relational and he is able to be that bold in public because he can be that honest with God in private. He brings God all of his doubts, all of his worries, all of his concerns. And, and, you know, there are days when Jeremiah's faith hangs by the slenderest of threads. But because he knows who holds the other end of that thread, he will just give that thread a yank because he knows the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob holds the other end of that thread, and that God's a very stubborn, stubborn God. And so because of his faith, he is willing to come to God with his biggest, his most challenging, his most depressing questions. He can go to God with his anger, his despair, his hope, and just put it all out there. The way that Jeremiah argues with God is the way that we talk with people with whom we trust completely. The people with whom we, we never have to worry about that relationship falling apart because we are just so certain of them and we can just be honest about our fears, our joys. We can bring up anything that matters. We can bring up the, ma the things that are just too important to be brought up in anything other than a private moment. If you think about the people that know your deepest fears, that you trust with your innermost being, the places that are just simply fragile in your lives. This is what Jeremiah is presenting to God in his prayers. And because Jeremiah has this depth of a relationship with God, he can yell at God and say, you got me into this, but also know that God is going to get him out of it too. My friends, I believe that the boldness of Jeremiah's public ministry is rooted in the rawness and honesty of his prayers. Having trusted God with his greatest fears and his worst worries and finding God still with him, he can walk into town wearing underwear that's rotten. Because he's already dealt with his worst demons. He's already put them in front of God and he and God have already hashed that out. And so after doing that, walking into town in, in rotten underwear, eh, just part of the job, right? Greatness in public ministry and service to others. Boldness in following Jesus Christ today is rooted in honesty of prayer yesterday. If you've ever wondered what it, why it is you don't have the courage or why it is we don't have the courage to do what God desires, it might be that we lack courage today because we weren't honest in prayers yesterday. Our prayers might have been just a little bit too shallow. Today is the day to start praying like Jeremiah does privately, honestly, rawly, so that tomorrow we can be bold publicly. We're going to come to a time of prayer shortly like we always do. And now what, what, what do we do, right? I say, what are your joys and concerns? And we share our joys and concerns. And they're good joys and they're good concerns and they're important for us to share. But you know what they're not? They're not praying like Jeremiah prays, are they? They're not real. I mean, and it's not that we really could either. If we prayed every week together, each of us praying like Jeremiah prayed, A, we'd be here for a long time. And B, it's just too raw. It, it, to be able to pull out the, your innermost fears, your innermost worries, your, your greatest hopes, to be able to pull those out and to share those with everyone here in this room, you just can't do that every week. It's just too hard. 
I, I think this is part of the wisdom of what Jesus says uh, when he says, you got to go into a private closet by yourself and pray, and the God who sees in private will reward you. This is the type of prayer that you do in the closet by yourself, the type of prayer that Jeremiah prays. And so we're going to come to this time of prayer shortly, and I'm not going to ask you to tell us what your joys and concerns are. I'm going to do something different today. I'm going to give you a sheet of paper, and on it, I'm going to invite you to write the prayer like Jeremiah writes. What do you need to say to God? What is your biggest fear that just hits you right now? What's your greatest joy that you, it's just wonderful? What's the hope that you dare not say out loud? I'm going to sh invite you to take some time and to write that. And, and, to, and to show you a bit of what that might look like, um, I'm going to I get up and I write in this every morning. This is how I pray. This is my pr book of prayers. And um, I don't share out of it often. There's only one person I've ever invited to read it. And then I married her. Uh, so this is very intensely private to me. And I, I struggled with uh, whether even to share this with you because... It is. It's not, this isn't about me. I don't. It's not about me. But I, I, I fear at times that I look like Jeremiah, the prophet who's willing to do go go and be bold and to do something wild and you know let's just do this and trust. You see me do that, but you don't often hear me pray like this. And so, can I pray right now? I'm going to pray. It's going to be honest. Let's pray. Lord, your people are, are struggling. All around me, I, I see Christians fighting with other Christians that make a mockery of you, the Prince of Peace. I, I called a friend this week, and, and I found out that his, his church is struggling to the point they can't even talk to each other. And, and he told me that the DS is having to come in. And, and as we pray right now, there's a DS meeting with his church because they just can't figure out how to be church together. And they're, they're struggling right now. And it's not just that. I read the news and the flagship seminary, the place where the Anglican Church in America, General Theological Seminary, they are tearing themselves apart right now because eight Christian professors say that they have a problem and the board of Christians who manage the seminary cannot even sit down to listen. They are so stubborn and stuck in their own beliefs. They, must, they can't even sit down to agree that they have a problem. I go to clergy gatherings here in Missouri, Lord, and I hear of nothing but strife these last months as we argue about our camps and we argue about what's going to be next. We argue about how we have been ignored or, or abused or, or just not listened to, and, and I hear strife among pastors, and then I come here back to my home and I watch Christians divided and unwilling to come together here as well. And Lord, this breaks my heart. It leaves me wondering whether you are still in the business of reconciliation. Do you still change lives? Are we doomed to always be at odds with each other? Because if so, I don't know how long I can do this. But, but I know that you have changed my life, and I know there was a moment... In Easter worship years ago when I stood there with a woman who with all things had broken apart with her and everything was going on the rocks, it was falling apart and then this fellow pastor, I turned to Julie and she turned to me and we broke bread together and we were at peace in a way that I never would have seen coming and it was only possible because of you. And so I'm going to hold on to that Lord right now because I need some hope. I need something to hold on to. And holding on to that, I'm going to keep on proclaiming your good news. And I'm just going to need your help to get through today and trust you with tomorrow. I'm going to trust that you can continue to change me and change others. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with a whole heart. We fail to be an obedient church. 
We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As a people who are committed to being at peace with each other, building peace, forgiving each other, reconciling, I invite you to stand and offer each other signs of that peace right now. Handshakes, hugs, whatever works for you.